Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We might be standing in the darkest moment of our lives. The earth might be shaking round about you. But like that Roman soldier, when you look to the cross and you look to Jesus, you're going to get a revelation. You're going to get an understanding. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're bigger than my problems. You're bigger than my problems. Oh, thank God you're bigger. You're bigger. <laughs> you know everything, the beginning from the end. You know how my life is going to turn out, and so I come and I yield my life to you because I know that you don't make any mistakes, oh God. You don't make mistakes. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, enlarge my borders. Bless me, oh God. And enlarge my borders, I pray. Oh, Spirit of God, make me who you want me to be. Make me who you want me to be. The church of Laodicea received the most horrifying instructions from the Lord. The church of Philadelphia was full of commendation, well done's, way to go. But the church of Laodicea was at the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It was the church that not one good thing was said about it. All of the other churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyra, Tyra, you name it, they all at least had a, a little glimmer that they had done something right. But that the church of Laodicea, the risen Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord, didn't have one good thing to say about it. And it was all because of their attitude. I've got to talk to you this morning about attitude. Listen to me. Your attitude is so important in the kingdom of God. Your attitude might be one of the most critical elements of your spiritual life. If you don't have the right attitude, if you don't have a heart that is hard and going after God, you know, not hard in a hard sense, but serious about going after God, then you're in the category of the Laodicean church. This church received a slap on the face. I don't know, it was what we might call the slap that was heard around the world. Anybody up to speed on Will Smith and Chris Rock? <laughs> sure, we've all heard about it. It's been the talk of the town all week long. But I'll tell you something, church. When this pronouncement came over the church, it was a slap that was heard around the world. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth because you're not hot. Neither are you cold, but you're just tepid. You're lukewarm. You're average. God forbid that you ever think of yourself as being an average Christian. If you ever hear those words coming out of your mouth, well, I'm just an average Christian, you're in deep, deep trouble. This is the church of Laodicea. You see, they lived in a place that was surrounded by wealth. It was the banking center of Asia Minor. 
The city of Laodicea was so rich that when they were devastated by an earthquake, they wouldn't receive any money from Rome. They wouldn't accept any money from the governor to help them rebuild. They said, no, we have need of nothing. We've got it all under control. And the church that was in the environment of that city had exactly the same attitude. We have need of nothing. When your spiritual journey gets you to the place where you think you've got it all together, where you think you've got it made, where you think that you've, you've, you've going to soar through, as it were, then you're the church of Laodicea. God comes back and he says to them, oh, just, just wait a minute. I, I want you to understand something. I want you to realize that you're in bigger trouble than you think. You're actually wretched, poor, blind. And naked. You see, you have to do a little research, but those were all things that tied the church of Laodicea to the city of Laodicea. The city of Laodicea had a great medical center. They had discovered an eye salve that was literally exported all over the then known world that helped people that had an eye disease to be healed. So they thought that they had it all together. Jesus said, you're blind. You're blind. They were the center of the textile trade and the clothing uh, manufacturing industry of the country. And Jesus said, no, no, you're naked. You might think that you've got the best clothes and the best woolens of anywhere in the country, but I want you to know something. You're really naked. You might think that you've got enough money to pay all your bills, but I want you to know you're really poor. I take that it's high time that I examine my heart. I take it that it's appropriate for me to look in the mirror and to see how I'm lining up to the will and the word and the purposes of God. Am I hot? Am I cold? When hypothermia sets in, you're as good as dead. Is that right? It takes a lot to revive somebody that is suffering from hypothermia. You're cold. And if you're not cold, you could be hot. Oh, that we were all hot. Would that we were all pressing into God with such fervor and with such an attitude that there's nothing that matters like the presence of God. There's nothing that I want more than Jesus and his intimacy and his anointing. Nothing. I'll do anything. I'll lay anything aside. I'll adjust my agenda. I will make changes so that I can press into God. Amen. If you're not willing to adjust your agenda so that you can grow in your faith, then you're in trouble. That's what the risen Savior is saying to this church and to us. Then he goes on and he says, you're lukewarm. You see, for this church, there was no words of praise. There was no redeeming traits. This church was mentioned back in the book of Colossians, chapter 4. If you have been reading there lately, you might have come across it. Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans and to a couple of other churches in the neighborhood. And he said, I want you to read this letter, the letter to the Colossians. He said, after you have read it here, I want you to take it and read it to the church of Laodicea, chapter 4. And then he said something, he got really personal and he addressed the bishop of Laodicea. This is 30 years prior to John the Revelator getting this vision. God was already pulling at the heartstrings of the church of Laodicea back in Paul's day, in his hour, and under his ministry. And he said to Archippus, the bishop of Laodicea, he said, take heed and finish the work that I've called you to do. We wonder, 
you know, as we study this out and we look at it, was the church of Laodicea already in decline? Was it already in trouble? Were they already thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to think? Can we go a little bit deeper? The problem that this church had was an attitude of indifference. An attitude of indifference. I know if I just say one name here, it'll elicit a whole lot of emotions. So I'm going to do it. Donald Trump. You either love him or hate him. I haven't found anybody in between yet. People either love Donald Trump or they hate Donald Trump. They either think he's the greatest thing since Jesus or they think he's the Antichrist incarnate. I've discovered something if you want me to poke the bear a little bit more. I've discovered something in my counseling of married couples over the years. I've discovered that as long as, there's, as, long as they're fighting, there's hope. Don't come to me after you've stopped fighting. I'm of no use to you. As a counselor, I'll be of no value to you if you've stopped fighting. Let me explain it for just a minute. You see, once you get to the point where you're stopped fighting, you've become indifferent. And you could care less. You could care you absolutely care nothing about this marriage anymore. You're not going to put any more effort into it. You're not going to sacrifice anymore. You're not going to give. You're not going to be accept, uh, accept anything that the other partner might do for you. You're indifferent. Indifferent people don't fight. Indifferent people don't care. Indifferent people think that, nah, I'm just going to, do it my way. I'm just going to somehow drift through life. But I'm not going to put any more effort into this relationship. Oh, bless God. As a pastor, I want you to be fighting when you come and talk to me. Indifference is a kind of icy death. Indifference is when nothing matters. When you just throw your hands up in the air. William Barclay, a great biblical scholar, said concerning indifferent people, he said, you aren't on the way, you are in the way. <laughs> this church of Laodicea wasn't on the way anymore, it was in the way. If you're not hot, if you're not pressing into God, you're not on the way anymore, you're in the way. Can I get an amen? amen? Come on, look in the mirror and say, Lord, are you talking to me today? What do I need to grab out of this? What do I need to adjust? What do I need to realign? What do I need? How do I need to set my agenda differently? I don't want to be tepid. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be indifferent. When somebody who loves somebody appeals to that other individual and that individual doesn't care one way or the other, then obviously love is frustrated. It's hands are tied. Nothing is going to be done. There's not going to be anything reciprocated. You stand there now neutralized. The risen Savior, the church of Laodicea, had neutralized the anointing of God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just become complacent and indifferent? And you could be sitting in the midst of a glorious worship service... You could be sitting under a, a powerful word, but you're just indifferent. And it just goes right over your head. Shoo. Shoo. And you get up, 
turn on your heels and walk out the door. Sometimes I say it's like you've been inoculated against Christianity. I don't know about you, but sometimes I pray for our kids, the little ones that are out there in children's church. God, don't let us inoculate them against Christianity. Don't let us give them some sort of a vaccine that would help them to become compliant and indifferent or lukewarm. Do you understand? You get the picture? How many kids have been inoculated against the things of God because you as parents have been lukewarm? Heavy. Come on. Heavy. But it's true. And so we find here that this church of Laodicea was in a lot of trouble. Jesus is on the outside of the church of Laodicea and knocking to get back in the church. Jesus can be booted right out of your life as a believer. You can slam the door shut in the face of Jesus because you are rich and increased and you have need of nothing. You're not a dirty sinner anymore. You haven't been cheating on your wife. You haven't been out robbing banks or doing holdups. You've got it all together. You get up and you go to work nine to five. You salute the boss. You get the job done. You cut your grass. You're a good neighbor. You pick up your garbage. You understand you've got it all together. But you put Jesus on the outside again. Outside of your life. Now you're just going through things by rote. Just because of habit. Just because this is the way that you do things now. You're going to do it whether Jesus is there or not. And the Bible says Jesus comes to you. He comes to the church and he knocks. Do you know what? There is not a latch or a doorknob on the outside of your heart. I found this interesting as I was studying and researching and and trying to understand what was going on here at the church of Laodicea. And um, I've been to Japan numerous times. I love it, love the people, love the country. It's a very fascinating place. And the National Christian Council of Japan, of all places, of all people, because the church in Japan is still very small, The church of Japan is still struggling. The church of Japan is still trying to have a great breakthrough. But the Christians that were there and belonged to the National Council, in a document that they were putting together, and they sought to point out the distinctive differences between Christianity and other religions, came up with one notable difference. Are you ready? They said, God in Christianity, the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is the one that initiates the search. No other God. Buddha doesn't go looking for his people. Confucius doesn't go looking for his people. You know, in the Hindu religion, you know, the, the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of gods aren't out there looking for their people. It's only in the heart of Christianity do you discover that God himself, the ruler of the creation, the creator of heaven and earth, he's the one that initiates and he goes out in search of the lost and the dying. The next time somebody starts to argue with you about the validity of Christianity, just ask them if Buddha's been knocking at their door lately. And they'll have to admit that he hasn't come a-knocking. But I'll guarantee you that Jesus has. Jesus has come a-knocking. St. Bernard, an old monk, 
in the monastery used to say to his young monks, it doesn't matter how early you get up to pray. You'll always find that God is there waiting for you. Isn't that powerful? Don't write off all these old monks. <laughs> doesn't matter how much you fast, how early you get up. You'll always find God there waiting for you. That's our God. Don't lock him outside the door. Don't push him out of your life. Holman Hunt painted a picture. It was called The Light of the World. And on this picture, there was one very notable thing that ultimately it became famous for, and that's what I've already alluded to, is that there was no door handle on the outside of the man's heart. Isn't that amazing that God has given you so much authority over your own life? Amen. That God has given you the power of a will that you can say yes or no to the God of the heavens. Amen. That he's not going to barge in. That he's not going to kick the door down. But he's going to stand on the outside knocking. And if you go and you put your ear up against the door, you'll hear the sweet, gentle voice of the Savior saying, Behold, if you let me in, I'll come in and we'll sup together. We'll dine together. We'll fellowship. Jesus wants to know you more than you want to know him. Isn't that amazing, Mike? That God wants to get to know you. That he wants you to invite him in so that you can talk and fellowship. You say, oh, I'm not worthy. Let God be the judge of that. God goes after the down and the outers. He invites the individuals that are out in the highways and the byways to come into the banquet. He leaves the 99 and he goes searching for the one lost lamb until it's found. He won't let a rebellious king run from his grasp. And David said, though I go to the highest mountain, though I go to the lowest valley, though I go into the depths of the sea, God, you're still there. Yes. Wash me and I'll be clean. Yes. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Psalm 51. Let God be the judge as to whether or not you're worth saving. Yes. And you'll always come to the conclusion that God loves you. Amen. He bore your sins. He took your chastisement upon him. This is the church of Laodicea. The church that we find in a state of hopelessness. A church that we find in a state of disrepair and brokenness. And yet they thought that they had it all together. Church, when I invite you, when Glenn invites you, whoever invites you to press into God, do it. Do it. Because we sense something, we see something that for some reason you're just not pressing in right now. You're just not giving God everything that you ought to be given to God. And so we stop to exhort and to encourage and to admonish and to invite. And we say, come on, raise your hands, lift your voice, begin to pray. Because we know that it's so easy to become lukewarm. It's so easy to become indifferent. It's so easy to become complacent. It's so easy to just take God for granted. The Bible says that familiarity breeds contempt. You ever heard that scripture? It's just as true in human relationships as it is in our spiritual relationship. Yes, it is. The reason 
why sometimes people of God become discouraged is because God doesn't give them everything they want. Because God doesn't answer their prayers every time they snap their fingers. At least they don't think he is. But isn't no an answer? Amen. No is an answer. Amen. And sometimes when you and I pray, God, our Heavenly Father, looks down at us and he says, I know that you want it. I know that you think you know, you know best, but I'm just saying no. You just can't have it. At least not now. At least not now. Besides that, there's some pieces to the puzzle over here that I'm still working on, trying to get that all together so that when I answer your prayer, it'll all fit neatly and make the picture complete. The church of Laodicea was in dire situation. We got two guys on the road to Emmaus and Jesus comes and he joins himself together with them. And they've said, well, haven't you heard that they crucified Jesus Christ? And the Bible says that without opening their eyes, without saying who he was, he just started to journey with them. And as he was journeying with them, he went right back to Moses and the law and the prophets and he expounded the things concerning the Savior. Amen. It came to the end of the day and towards the end of the journey and they were ready to turn in to Emmaus and they said to this stranger that had now become their friend, won't you join us for supper? And he said, no, no. He said, That's, I can't impose. I'm just going to keep moving along. And as he pretends, as it were, to begin moving along, uh, they kept imploring him, no, please, come. Let's eat together. Please sit down. We'll, we'll, we'll buy. It's our treat tonight. <laughs> come and have supper with us. And finally they persuaded this stranger to come and stay the night with them and have supper with them. And the Bible says that as they sat at the table and Jesus took the bread and the Bible says in the breaking of bread, their eyes were opened. And they realized it was Jesus. They saw the nail prints in his hand. And they looked to one another and they said, Did not our hearts burn within us? Were we not hot in the presence of God? Did we not sense that the very creator of the universe was there on this journey with us? Oh, Lord Jesus. Let our hearts burn once again. Forgive us for our indifference. Forgive us for our lackadaisical attitudes. And come and ignite the fire. Paul said to Timothy, and I'm saying to you as a church, you've got to fan the flame. You've got to blow on the embers. You've got to stir the coals. I don't care who you are, how long you've been in the faith. You've got to get up every day and you've got to get the fire burning every day. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness and the tabernacle was sojourning and going through the wilderness with them, the Bible says that they always had to take the coals off the altar and they put it in the censer and they took the coals with them and they kept the coals hot until they were able to stop and reconstruct and rebuild the tabernacle. And then they would have live coals that they could put on the altar again and they could blow on them and fan them into a flame so that the sacrifices could be offered. That was a picture of what God wants you to do today. He wants you to fan those coals. How do you do that? You get back on your knees and you pray. You get back in the house of God Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, as the habit of some is. Even as you see the day approaching, you've got to get back so that you can blow on the coals. What do you do when you're out camping? You get the coals, then you take a log and you put it on top of the coals. 
If you're coming to church and you find that you're cold and you find that you're bis a little bit indifferent, you need to scan the auditorium and you need to find somebody that's really pressing into God and then you've got to go and sit beside them. Don't avoid them. Get close to the fire. Get close to the anointing. Come and seek his face. To the church of Laodicea, you're neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm. You're indifferent. And I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. What's God saying to you today? Where are you at? Is it time for you to blow on the fire once again? I don't know if you realize it or not, but someday in the not too distant future, you are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You can't avoid the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says in the book of Corinthians that your words and your works, they're all going to be tried. They're all going to be judged. And for some... He said, your works and your words and your attitudes are all going to be thrown into the fire. But by grace, you might be saved. Oh, you'll get into heaven. But instead of hearing the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you're going to be standing there empty-handed. It's not too late to respond to the Holy Ghost and say, Jesus, help me blow on the fire. Holy Spirit, come and breathe on me. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. I want to be able to fan what is within me into a raging fire once again. I want to be able to breathe on that hot coal in my heart until it bursts back into a flame. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Don't let me be indifferent or cold. If you sense the fire ebbing, you sense the flame lowering. It is hardly even flickering anymore. And you'd say, God, make this commitment to God, not me. Put your hand up and say, Jesus, I'm going to fan the flame. I'm going to fan the flame. I'm going to fan the flame. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, you see... Jesus is standing at the door knocking. He's not going to come in and blow on the flame if you don't open the door. He's not going to come in and fan the life back to a place of red hotness if you don't open the door. Someone might be here today and you've been on the outside looking in. Jesus would say, come on, don't keep me shut out of your life. Let me in. Let me become your Lord and Savior. Let me bring the promises and the covenants of God to you. Let me become your Lord and Master and your Savior. You're here today and you're a candidate for change. You've been on the outside looking in for too long. You'd slip your hand up and say, Pastor, will you pray with me because I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Amen. I see your hand. Anyone else that would slip your hand up and say, I've been on the outside for too long. Been on the outside for too long. And I want Jesus to become my Lord and Master. Jesus to be my Savior. I'm so glad you joined us today and you heard what the Word of God said to us about the Laodicean church. In actuality, they were the words of the risen Savior. And he burned into our hearts how he hates indifference. And I'm going to pray for you and me and for all of us that we will never become indifferent in our relationship with Jesus Christ because I'm sure that you, like me, never want Jesus to be on the outside knocking, trying to get into our lives. And so would you join me now in prayer? Heavenly Father, we know that you hate indifference, lukewarmness. And Father God, we repent of it. We desire to press into your life, into your spirit. We ask you to come and work in our hearts, instill within us a passion for the things of God. 
Let the Holy Spirit come to motivate us and to burn within our hearts a zeal for you, Lord Jesus. And so, Father God, as we draw near to you, we know you will draw near to us. And so we come to you now and we say, Lord, don't let us become indifferent. And we're going to guard our hearts against indifference. And we're going to ask you to help us to be overcomers. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Join us for Easter Sunday next week.